the way I describe a fat is you can uh, put a plate on the back of that body condition score five sheep and and have her walk um, down the barn and the plate will stay on her back. Um, so it, basically our goal is for our sheep to lamb when they're around a three and a half body condition and we would expect to see them lose weight while they um, are raising their lambs because they're milking some of their extra body reserves and putting it into their lambs. Uh, one thing that I spend some time doing as a veterinarian um, is working with folks about um, ketosis or pregnancy toxemia that happens before lambing. And I think we see more of it uh, in the last 15 years because we've been better at selecting ewes that have three uh, lambs. But we haven't always been better about realizing we can subdivide a barn and put those girls that have the biggest bellies or maybe um, you are having someone ultrasound and fetal counter ewes. And so you know the ewes that are supposed to have three and four lambs. And really they just would be better off in their own group. Um, so that's just what the point of this slide is. Um, so I know you had a wonderful talk about nutrition two weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago. And um, while I like being the hero as a veterinarian, um, I also recognize that if we feed the sheep well, they will perform well for us. And so a lot of the issues that we deal with in sheep production really are based in needing to improve our nutrition. <clears throat> so this is just one of our ewes uh, at lambing time in late May. You can see the grass had gotten away from us, um, which commonly happens in late May. Um, and there's her um, lambs. Can you still hear me okay, Bernie and Megan? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, Jean sent some questions that were really wonderful. And um, one is about colostrum that the U produces. And so we think about the birth weight of lambs is um, about 75% gained in the last 30 days of pregnancy as a fetus. But 100% of the colostrum is produced in, again, that last 30 days and probably more importantly, the last 10 or so days of pregnancy. And so not only do we want a lot of colostrum, but we want good quality colostrum. And as producers, most of us um, aren't doing um, any measuring of quality, but certainly I think if you ever have a doubt, um, you should go steal some colostrum from a middle-aged you um, or use some colostrum replacer and there's lots of them out there but I just caution you if you're going to buy a product to buy one that says it's a colostrum replacer not supplement because what you're after um, is are the immune proteins or antibodies because um, you can provide for the nutrition through milk replacer. So again, we have to feed those ewes well, we have to make sure we that they're all healthy um, I never want to give a pregnant you a name because if she starts losing her healthy status, then she may be better to go bye-bye before um, she lambs. And if she has a name, it's a lot harder to make that decision. So health status um, not only affects their body condition and their appetite, but how normal their metabolism is, how well they compete, and how well their udders function. So I'll give an example, and I know my husband's not listening, but he keeps some 12-year-old ewes. And I'm not saying they're not healthy, but they're definitely not competitive. And so I, I suggest to him, look, you know, if you're going to keep those old girls because you're proud that they're still producing, you probably better put them in the old ewe home so that they can compete and get enough to eat and still be somewhat predominantly is influenced by genetics. And again, as an industry, we can afford to put um, more and more pressure on our ewes to use um, rams that come from heavy milking ewes. And then um, question about um, how to make lambing more efficient, how to make things go more smoothly, is I'm a big believer that about 30 days, or we could say anywhere from three to six weeks, ahead of lambing, that those ewes should come into a small pen or through a chute um, and as stressless 
stress-free as possible, they should get a clostridial vaccination. And I think all they really need is a clostridium um, CV and T vaccination. It goes under the skin on a dry sheep, and I give it um, under the skin of the neck of a dry sheep with a short needle. Okay. So this is me a long time ago. I thought this was how you were supposed to raise sheep because that's what my um, husband taught me is that you should tip up every ewe right after she lambs and the lambs haven't stood yet. Put the um, teeth in their mouth, squirt a little colostrum and um, tickle their tail head and away they go and they suck colostrum. And I still do this um, and think I should do this on farms where people are having a a lamb survivability issue. So if you're losing lambs and they're less than three days old, or you have diarrhea in your lambs and they're less than three days old, they certainly should get more colostrum and there's less back breaking ways to do this. You could just milk the ewe out um, and to feed the lambs. And we, we don't have any great studies in sheep that I know of about the difference between a lamb sucking colostrum, a lamb sucking a bottle of colostrum, or a lamb being too fed colostrum. But I think we can learn from our dairy calves. Um, and, uh, and the studies there have shown that um, tubing, it works just as well as a, as a calf sucking colostrum. So um, that's just a suggestion. Oh, sorry, back to that slide. Um, so I'll just share an opinion. And if whatever you're doing is working, then you don't necessarily need to change at home. And so I use um, a mixture of 7% iodine and then, um, so 50% of that and 50% ethyl alcohol, not isopropyl alcohol. And that's what I dip navels in. And the ethyl alcohol is getting to be more of a challenge to get anytime it starts um, making its way into the black market, helping make illicit drugs. Um, supplies get harder to get, but that helps dry the navel even faster. So if you have some lambs at home that are getting joint infections and you aren't dipping navels, I suggest you go to that um, cocktail. Okay. Um, so I like lambing pens that are big enough that the U has plenty of room. Um, I never really like finding a, a ewe that has laid on her lamb overnight because I was a bad manager and didn't give her enough room. I like visible lambing pens that I can really see what's happening. And then in the back of this pen is um, a tube that the Pipestone folks say they developed. Um, I can't remember, maybe Todd or Jean can re or Bernie can remember, but I think this is a six to eight inch um, diameter PVC pipe. It's capped on both ends, and um, and they we just have rectangular um, openings so that the you can reach your muzzle in there and drink water. And it's a real labor saver for uh, water in use. We don't have to um, put a bucket in and worry about the ewe's going to poop in the bucket or tip the bucket or a lamb's going to get in there and drown. I can't promise it'll work well in tonight's weather, but most of the time it works quite well. Okay. Cindy, we had a question come in if you'd like me to read it for you. Sure. Sure. All right, so the question is, what are your thoughts on on-farm freeze-drying of colostrum? Oh, wow. Freeze drying and not just like um, freezing in the freezer, I assume. Yeah, so you're above my um, knowledge level, I'll have to say. And maybe the person who asked that knows, um, knows more about the technology of freeze drying. Um, I actually am not fully um, well versed in how they make um, colostrum replacer. I know it's from cow colostrum and there must be some freeze drying to turn it into powder. So uh, it would be easy enough to test um, how well it worked for you and what you would do if you were doing it yourself. So I can't say I have an opinion because I don't have enough knowledge, but you would um, have somebody or maybe you're a nurse and could draw a serum sample, a blood sample, sorry, from a two day old lamb after it had that freeze dried colostrum. And then, um, 
um, let the blood clot separate from the serum, and then you would have um, somebody with a BRICS refractometer. So there are getting to be more and more people with those instruments. Um, look at the serum protein level and tell you that it approximates 5.5 um, to 6 grams per deciliter. And then if it did, then you'd know your freeze drying method worked really well. If you were down in the fours for a measurement on that serum protein from that lamb, then you know that that lamb wasn't getting enough immune proteins or antibodies from the freeze dried colostrum. So I buy, um, I think what's freeze dried colostrum comes in a little um, container. Um, there are several products out there and, and many of them are very good. Um, we're looking for um, more than 100 grams um, of IgG in that powder. And I buy one that has exactly how to mix it. Um, and uh, it happens to be called Rescue. Um, there's another one called Ultra 150 that has also been really good. Um, you kind of know when you start using colostrum replacer if it's working or not because then your lambs stay healthy. Great, thank you, Cindy. Um, okay, um, another on to um, um, some other basic stuff um, used in the UK. No more. I think we're losing you again, Cindy. Bear with us, everyone, as we try to get um, Cindy back on. And thanks to Lena for that suggestion. Um, what I'm going to do is go through and see if anyone has a live feed and turn that off, because sometimes that'll help boost up Cindy's power when she comes back on in bad weather. All right, I see Cindy joined us back on Zoom, so let's just give her a little bit to um, power everything up on our computer again. Hey, Cindy, you're back. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good deal. The lady in the motel tried to fix me up, but I don't know what to say. We'll just hope it gets better. <laughs> That's okay. What I'm going to do and what you might notice I did to everyone else on the screen is we stopped our video feed. Sometimes that boosts up the power that you can have. 
Um, it doesn't glitch as much. So I'll turn off your personal video. You can still share your screen and we can see that. We just won't see you individually. And hopefully that'll help a little bit. Uh, we can try a couple other things if it happens again. Um, and, and just to follow up on that question about the freeze-dried colostrum, Cindy, um, did you mention 5.5 to 6 grams per deciliter? Or what was that benchmark yeah. to, to look for? That's a normal, that means the lamb got enough immune proteins or antibodies. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so tomorrow morning, we're going to walk out to our barns and we're going to find cold lambs. Are we okay, Megan? <laughs> yep. Okay. So far, so good, Cindy. Okay. And because it's going to be so terribly cold tonight. Or is it actually a lamb that's more and enough calories from not getting um, enough milk? If you poor mother use in our flock, we um, if you haven't never put it, the wrong lambs in the wrong jug with the wrong mother, um, it's because you haven't raised sheep for enough decades and it will happen to you and you'll be very embarrassed if you um, walk out and find that you actually lambing and you thought Here, how's, oh my goodness. Are we there? Yep, we Cindy, can hear we can, you. Yep, mm -hmm. we can hear you. Um, we don't I'm see going. your slides anymore. Okay, hang on a second. Let me ask her if she's got any better place for a signal. Are there any better anywhere? I keep losing them. Private. I try that. Thank you. I'm going in the motel office and I'll share the screen again. Here you go. What are you doing here? Do we need to be dark? No. Okay, there's the light switches behind All the right. door. There. Thank you. We can shut this. How's this, you guys? Oh, I can't hear yeah. it. On. Sounds good. I okay. can hear it. It sounds good and we can see your screen again. Okay. All right. Um, and then lastly, like starvation, um, it takes a heck of a good you to raise an even set of triplets. Um, and so it's not um, terrible if we have to pull one lamb out of a set of triplets. It's not terrible to pull one quadruplet. And then lastly, if you are, are have lambs that are um, getting into the wrong mixing pens and you're not using paint brands, it's such an easy management tool, and once you start using them, you'll never go backwards. There's what I call a good udder, you know, the teats kind of point, point toward the lens. Um, stomach tubes. Um, anybody who's afraid to stomach tube has to remember to tell themselves the lamb will die if you don't learn how to stomach tube. And I'm always amazed at how many people don't realize you can always feel that tube going down the neck. So I hold the lamb. I think there's a picture right here of our... Um, of our uh, former colleague, Dr. Jerry Kennedy, where you hold the lamb between your legs and you pass the tube and the lamb swallows and then pinch the either side of the neck. So right here with your fingers. So right there. And you can feel that tube going past you when it's in the esophagus. If it's in the trachea, you'll never feel it. So it's hard to believe we have about 1,100 U's and I still, um, feel for every tube that I'm passing on every lamb. Why? Because it's a horrible feeling to have put it in the trachea by accident and, and then the lamb's going to die when you pour milk into its lungs. Um, I like the clear tubes, um, not to do a commercial, but it's the only way I know that tube is actually one I should continue to use, that I've been cleaning it well enough. And I'm also not shy to throw them away and get a new one out. If you are still afraid about tubing lambs, um, ask a friend of yours to hang on to a dead lamb and practice on a dead lamb and uh, you'll get over your fear. Okay, so um, that's, uh, and how much should a lamb get? 
that's real personal preference because there's more and more of us raising hair sheep now that um, are smaller lambs. Um, I typically am going to give between four and eight, eight ounces, but I don't raise huge sheep. If they were a big black faced sheep and you want to give them 12, go right ahead. But um, I just want to, I want to give them enough that they're not in a milk coma. Okay, so how do you- um, Cindy, if you don't mind a quick question on tubing. Uh, yeah. Is there a difference in, in sound that you can listen for between a lung sound and a gurgling so that you can also check that you're in that right place? People talk about that. Um, you know, it depends on how good your hearing is, how quiet it is in your barn. Um, you know, to be the safest, if you didn't want to do the finger pinching, you would actually um, want to suck on the end of the tube. And if you're in the airway, you're just going to get air back. If you're in the esophagus, you're just going to get um, nothing like hard suction back. Nothing, you won't be able to suck back. But I don't want to promote that because I don't want you to have your mouth on your on your stomach tubes because um, sooner or later you're going to catch something. So you can, in theory, hear air if they're breathing. Um, you shouldn't really hear anything in their stomach because their stomach's pretty empty. That's why you're tubing them. Um, okay, so back to cold lambs. You could warm them up in your pickup. Um, most pickup heaters uh, are pretty efficient and work well. Um, but if the lamb is so cold that it can't hold its head up, then you better not tube it because it's just likely to reflux that milk and aspirate it. And so that's where we give the warm intraperitoneal dextrose. Um, and I think I can take you through how to do that. Um, Sorry, the slide's kind of long and I'll give them to Megan and everybody to post. But basically you buy some 60 cc syringes and you draw up 20 mils of sterile dextrose with a new needle. And then you can use um, some fluids from an IV fluid bag or you could boil um, tap water and draw up 30 mils of tap water. And then ideally use a 20 gauge one inch needle that's never been used before. And then you give the injection right here in the X. Um, um, it's not magical, it doesn't have to be the right hand side, but it's good if it is the right hand side um, of the lamb. Did I say that wrong? The lamb's left hand side, sorry. Um, but it is not magical. You give either side, but near the umbilicus and point toward the opposite hip. So this is a, I stole this picture and if I redid it, we'd point the syringe down um, into the X and give the injection and then warm the lamb up. And why do you do it that way is you got to give that lamb some calories to generate heat. If you just try to warm it up without the calories, its brain's going to go into a coma. Okay, so one thing to caution you on is sheep producers, we tend to be frugal. And so you might save a bottle of dextrose from one year to another. And if you look at that bottle and there's some gray cloudy things floating in it, throw that bottle away um, because those are bacteria growing and you don't want to put those in the lamb. Cindy, okay. could, um, you my, use, yeah. could you use the same technique to warm up goat kids? You sure could. It would work just fine. Yep. Great. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Um, this is a technique that um, probably is a British book that a friend of mine um, thinks is worth mentioning. So I usually try to. And that's where we pass the stomach tube and we stop mid neck and this lamb's laying on its side and you pinch off below the stomach tube and we close the nostrils and the mouth with our hand and then we do put the stomach tube into our mouth and we blow and the air comes out and it hits our fingers and goes back up the esophagus into the back of the mouth and comes down the trachea um, to the lungs. So those are usually lambs that were born alive but don't have aren't taking good breaths um, and you're just trying to give them some some room room oxygen air. The other thing that works really well and isn't scary to do at all, but right here on the midline is a, is a seam. It's called a philtrum. So we've got a nostril, a nostril on the other side, and this seam right here is take a needle or a pen or even straw, but something sharp and that you can push hard with and push right there and twirl. And that's an acupressure point to stimulate breathing. 
Um, certainly those methods where we poke straw on the nose will help, um, but the, this little pushing right here on the seam is really helpful and the stomach tubing is helpful too. Okay, large teats on our farm that you might have a lot of milk, but she gets a special tag that, that indicates she's to lamb inside and that she's to get culled after she weans lambs. So this is just a picture of an okay lamb and a starving lamb. They're both hers. In fact, there's obviously, are, to me, obviously there's a dead one because this little dot here and this dot here meant that they were branded triplets, but there's only um, two of them here now. And so that's not a sheep we would ever keep a ram out of. Okay, um, let's just move along. How much colostrum do lambs need? So here's some, um, a table I adapted from UK data. And so let's take a um, nine pound lamb. It needs, um, if it's indoors, it needs 24 ounces. Who feeds 24 ounces? Maybe the U does, but I never do of colostrum. That's how much it really should get. If it's born outside and it's a windy, rainy, um, late April or middle of May, that um, amount of ounces it needs goes up by four ounces. So that's kind of um, gives you a lot of respect on how much milk the ewes can produce. Okay, so what are other substitutes for ewe colostrum would be goat colostrum. If you were a disease freak like I am, um, we would heat treat it where we still had good immune proteins, but we had tried to kill off any bad bacteria. Um, I, and the same is true on cow colostrum, um, where ideally it comes from a herd of cows that doesn't have yonis, and cow colostrum is not as calorie dense, so we should feed more cow colostrum um, per lamb um, than we would if we were feeding ewe or goat colostrum. Things we don't want to introduce um, are crypto. So most cow dairies do have crypto. Um, salmonella, um, yonis, that's an abbreviation for yonis. Um, K99 E. coli, if you don't already have that. And so are all the powdered colostrum sub substitutes the same quality? Probably not. But if you've been using one and it's working well, by all means, that's a good one to stay with. So I mentioned that's just one example of a product. <coughs> okay, um, let's just move on here. This is just an interesting thing to discuss. I really like my little um, milk pump um, because I can get a pretty large volume of colostrum. But one of my um, veterinary colleagues who raises goats, and she's a very critical thinker, thinks that these actually exert a little too much pressure and can damage the teat. Um, so I just throw that out there because this year I only used it once and that you developed mastitis 24 hours after I used it. And so up to this day, I keep hitting my head saying, wow, maybe I was too aggressive with the milk pump and I, I caused that mastitis. So it's always interesting, you know, just to share information and see if it's working well for you or, or if you've had problems too. But um, for me, it made it a lot easier to get colostrum out of a big T did you. Okay, milk production problems. We could have OPP, which is a virus that if you do have that causing milk production problems, then both sides of the udder are firm and don't have much milk. They're not hot, they're not red, they're not painful. There's just not much milk there, even though it looks like a nice udder from a distance. Um, the only way to diagnose that's the problem in the udder is after um, the ewe is ready to wean her lambs and right before you're gonna color, is I just um, sedate them and take a scalpel blade and I take a little bit of udder tissue and I have it looked at under the microscope and can see some classic changes from OPP. Um, we can do a blood test and it can tell you that the U um, is infected, but it won't necessarily say that her udder is um, having problems from the infection. Okay, um, protein deficiency. Well, I go to some farms where I know the folks know that what sheep should eat in terms of protein to make milk, but maybe the only hay they have because we had such a high rainfall year, for example, um, is some lesser quality hay. 
And so the U's are oftentimes they're, you know, polypay or real prolific type U's that are trying to raise triplets and they just don't have a normal amount of milk. And so um, it is something I do spend time working with producers and having their ration analyzed. And if we aren't in the ballpark of 16% protein in the overall ration, then it's amazing. Now we can, you know, buy some cheap protein supplements like dried distiller's grain and add it um, at a low percentage and bring that ration up and the milk production can respond. But we can't ignore this very long. Some people today still speculate that high protein can cause hard um, and hard mammary glands and poor protein, I mean, and poor milk production. I'm a skeptic that that actually does occur. And as I mentioned, the overall ration needs to be a, a I like to, to say a 16% ration. Okay, so there's an OPP hard bag. Um, let's talk a little bit about bacterial mastitis. That only affects one side of the gland, so one side of the udder. Rarely do you see bacterial mastitis affecting both sides. Um, and you have to ask yourself when you pick, when you notice it, was it there ahead of lambing? Did it happen the last year at weaning? Um, or is it active right now? Um, if it's active right now, we try to treat it. Um, if it's just mostly scar tissue, you make a note in the records um, and put a call tag in that you and, and plan to get rid of her after weaning. So how can we have less mastitis? Wow, that's a $20 million question with no perfect answer. Certainly, um, when we get ready to wean ewes, we should lower their quality of their feed so they start making less milk. We should certainly keep their environment where they're really dry. Um, so if they're leaking any milk, we don't have any kind of mucky uh, stuff going up into the teeth. We should make it so they don't have to do a lot of um, five-minute miles, so they aren't banging their udders running around. Um, so just everything we can think of to take care of the udder. I've even gone so far as to dip the teats in some barrier teat dips, which I don't recommend because I got more teat dip on me than I think I did the sheep because they weren't used to me touching them there. But um, but it's a tough one. In other countries, there are some mastitis vaccines made specifically for sheep, but they haven't made their way into this country. Um, a little bit about um, blue bag, so the really um, fast acting toxic mastitis. This is oftentimes in some of our best milking ewes, and they um, get a really swollen udder in a very in a hurry. Um, it's very sore. The milk turns almost clear, um, and those kind of ewes in my hands, I can at least save their life, but I can't necessarily save their udder. Um, so um, those are the kinds of situations where we might leave one lamb on the ewe, but we won't leave two or three lambs on the ewe. And the only reason I leave one lamb on her is I'm trying to give her a reason to stay alive. This is the um, barrier teat dip that I've used in sheep. Um, it's a blue film. It does make a pretty good barrier. Um, and so if you're going into like a March or April lambing and it's getting pretty wet, where you have your sheep and there's nothing you can do about it. This is something to think about. Okay, um, dead baby lambs. Um, first, if you want to um, have a necropsy, try to negotiate sort of a group rate, if you will, with your veterinarian. It's cheaper if you took them to the clinic than paid for the veterinarian to come out. <coughs> um, if you want to do your own necropsies, remember that um, it takes a while to learn normal anatomy. Um, it can be done, but you want to have a diagram there um, to help you. And I would try to get someone to teach me before I just launched on my own. A couple things to point out in these lambs. <coughs> this lamb right here, my cursor, is that showing up, you guys? Is um, It's kidney. Um, and we should never see the kidney that black and white, if you will, uh, or that purple, I should say, in a lamb. It should be like this kidney right here, which is buried in fat. <coughs> um, so this lamb did not starve to death. <coughs> 
this lamb did starve to death. So it burned up all its body fat. <coughs> I might have to go get a drink of water. Quick, guys, I'll be right back. <coughs> I got to get a drink of water. Thank you. Oh, there's a bed. I don't know. Maybe while she's getting a drink of water, feel free to, again to put in any questions that you might have for uh, Dr. Wolf as she's, uh, you know, with um, with some of the things that she's gone over so far. Feel free to go ahead and do that. Oh, it's not locked. It's pushed real hard. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, so what else can we see in these two lambs? We can see a little bit of pneumonia right here where it's purple is pneumonia, whereas this lamb's entire lung is nice and pink. Um, what else could I show you in this these two lambs? This is the abomasum that's full of milk on this lamb, whereas we can barely find the abomasum in this starved to death lamb. And all this gassy intestine is because it just didn't have any milk going through. Okay, so I'll move on. Now, a couple things we can all improve upon our skills of seeing sick lambs. Some of us, it's easier. Some of us, it's not as easy. So just reminding ourselves of normal lamb behavior is if we wake this lamb up, it should get up and stretch and then go find a teat. When it doesn't do that, you should take its temperature. <coughs> um, lamb's ears should always look perky, no matter if they're a long-eared breed or not. Does its belly look or feel full? Does its eyes seem to tune into the environment or are they kind of zoned out? And then the normal temp for a lamb in a jug is about 102 to 102 and a half. If it's 99, it's cold. I don't care if its mouth still feels warm to your cold finger, it's definitely getting cold. Um, if it's 103 and a half, it has a fever. And uh, you need to ask yourself, where's the fever coming from? And try to um, give it a broad spectrum antibiotic. So I can barely see this lamb in this picture here, but if you guys can see it, that's a lamb that's not got a normal posture. See how his back is a little bit arched? And that lamb was developing a joint infection. Okay. Um, I don't think I have a great point on that other than what a disaster here, right? A big udder, a whole bunch of dead lambs, a super thin you. She'd be about a body condition score of... 1.75. Um, here's a bunch of lambs that their mothers weren't doing a good job keeping track of them on pasture. And that's back in the day when I still had a child at home who wanted to help. Now they're all off into their own careers. Um, I mentioned about vaccinating ewes against CDNT a month before lambing. Uh, I personally prefer to lamb ewes that have been sheared unless it's going to be a gold barn and the ewes are too thin. Um, I mentioned to you that the goal on the body condition scoring should be about three and a half. I told you my favorite cocktail for dipping navels and that I really love paint brands. And I also like to mention that paint branding, everybody has their own system, but I think it's nice to paint brand ewes raising a single versus use raising twins versus use raising triplets differently. And I'm just going to share one system. I'm sure you all have your own systems that work very well. But for us, a you that is raising twins, she's branded on her right hand side and as are the lambs. A you that's raising single would be branded on the left hand side um, as would be her lambs. And a you that's raising triplets would be branded on the right side and they'd have a little dot over their numbers. And that way, if there's um, any kind of problems, we know how many we're looking for in a family. And then one more thing to mention is that you should stay eating well for that couple days that they're in the jug. And anytime you have a you that's not eating well, 
whether she's picking at her grain or maybe you don't grain feed and you just hay feed and she's got hay left over um, and you're, if you're hand watering, she's only drinking about three sips, that you needs to have her temperature taken because she's got some sort of um, uterine trauma and potentially infection brewing and she needs some flunixin, which is, I call it sheep aspirin or sheep ibuprofen and um, an antibiotic, which for me um, in a fresh you that's got a fever with IDs, penicillin or long acting tetracycline. So I used to think, well, this was all man-made. I used to think that must have been a you that I helped and I wasn't clean enough and I created that problem. So I backed off on how often I helped those use um, and I found I, actually they did just fine without my assistance. Um, but um, I still had some use that would develop fevers and I, it had nothing to do with me, whether it was maybe the environment or just a little bit of trauma from the birth process, I don't know. But I do know that in my hands, those use bounce back much more quickly if I try and treat them rather than just wait and see attitude. <clears throat> okay, so here's a little lamb that had tetanus. Um, and the toxins not as readily available as it once was, and that's because the um, manufacturing regulations changed and and not every company wants to make it anymore um, <clears throat> certainly if we um, didn't vaccinate lambs and we had tetanus on our farms i said that wrong if we didn't vaccinate pregnant ewes and we were banding lambs tails or testicles and had a our first case of tetanus um, we have a couple different approaches. One would be to use antitoxin. Another is we could still band the lambs, but we'd want to cut the tails off after two days. In other words, we take away this area where the tetanus bacteria were growing, was growing as, as that tail lost oxygen, and then the cases would virtually disappear. Um, rolled in lower eyelids or entropion. I guess I'm probably the only vet who thinks this is a minor genetic defect. I'd, I wish it didn't occur, but um, there are a lot more serious things that we do see, um, but it is a welfare concern. So we have a lamb, it's usually less than a day old and it starts having some tearing on its cheek. Get a little closer look and see that the lower eyelid is rolled in because actually the muscles are too, too tight. And um, there are lots of ways to fix these. Not fixing them is a problem. We get a corneal ulcer, corneal ulcer, and those lambs, if you were weighing them compared to their twin, would be getting smaller instead of bigger um, because of the pain on their cornea. So <clears throat> lots of approaches. One would be just to use a wound clip um, and get a pinch of skin in the wound clip and that'll tuck um, some skin out and pull it off the eye. eye. One would put a bleb of penicillin. I used to try the antibiotic-free way of using mineral oil. That didn't work as well for me. Another would be just to crimp the skin in my hemostat and take a little snip of that crimped um, skin um, out with the scissors and let it heal by what we call second intention. Um, or if it was a really valuable show lamb and you wanted to put some stitches in there after you remove that little moon shaped or uh, elliptical shaped piece of skin, that's fine too, um, but they do have to be fixed. Um, the old time farmer approach used to be that we take a pliers and just pinch the skin and create swelling. And I'm not sure that um, all the methods I described are more humane, but um, probably if I were defending them to an animal rights organization, they would seem more humane. So there's just uh, the skin rolling in. That's a horrible corneal ulcer. That happens in about four or five days on a bad case. And here's just a wound clip being put on. That, that's not scary to do at all. Okay, so what else do we need to make sure we have um, on hand? Well, I think we've mentioned all these things that step to scale, not absolute necessity. I like ear tagging lambs because um, it's hard to communicate and keep track um, and improve your sheep without some sort of individual ID. And um, I think everything else we mentioned. So um, why don't we do, let me look at what time we are. I know that um, I was asked to cover foot rot a bit. 
So should we do a little lambing questions and then move to foot rot? That works. We have a lot of questions that came in, Cindy. So I can start at the top and I wanna say we have about six, seven. So the first one is, uh, what is your opinion on dam specific versus herd mate colostrum? Um, so I look at sheep as a population and I have no issue with taking colostrum from another healthy sheep. If it's a ewe that already lost a lamb and I thought she had extra colostrum, that would not be my first choice. But a ewe that had a single that has a nice udder, I, I will norm, normally steal colostrum from her. And I like to, um, everybody's got a favorite ray, way of freezing it. Um, I just freeze it in Ziploc bags. Um, and that's fine. So healthy and the same population that that you came from should be a very good substitute. Great. When we're talking about antibodies and, and protein levels and testing that sample, what, what do you look for when you're trying to purchase equipment for that? So um, BRICS refractometer is called, is spelled, I think, B-R-I-X. And um, You'll have to Google that because I have only ever bought one. Um, they're kind of spendy, but people who are um, um, involved in regenerative agriculture are sometimes measuring some of the levels of their plant um, sugars and so forth with a BRICS refractometer. So your extension agent may have one as well. Gene may be, be able to pipe in here. Um, or you could just learn how to get those blood samples from lambs, put them in what we call red top tube, and then um, see if your veterinarian would measure the protein levels if you took those um, samples to your veterinarian. Drawing blood from healthy lambs isn't difficult, but you would want to be taught rather than self-teach yourself um, because we really like to use um, short needles, um, make that jugular vein stand up really well. Uh, what else could I say? Um, and lambs do fine. You can draw two mils of blood from a lamb and it'll never, never miss it. Great, thanks. Next question is, if you know your goat herd is clean, is it okay to feed unpasteurized goat colostrum to lambs? Sure, if you really know your goat herd is clean. Yeah, I mean, so what kinds of things do goats share to sheep? So um, most, most of my concerns would be Q fever, um, would be caseous lymphadenitis, uh, and yonis. Um, most of us who have sheep and goats um, do pretty well know what our goat situation is, and, um, and, and they're really a good um, animal to supplement your lambs with. Great. Um, next question is regarding that image that you had of the necropsy of the two lambs side by side. The question is, the rumen isn't developed when the lambs are born, correct? When would it start to develop is, if this is the case? Okay, so um, the rumen is not developed. It is, it is present on the left side. It contains um, amniotic fluid. Um, but, um, and how fast it develops depends on your management system. So if you have heavy milking ewes on grass, I think they're a little slower to develop than if you're a confinement-based operation where their lambs are on creep feed. So you should easily be able to see the rumen is larger than the abomasum by three to four weeks of age, yeah. Okay, great. And then just reiterating that um, everyone will get the slides from tonight. We'll post those in PDF form. So all of the charts that are included, we'll be able to share those in the pictures. Uh, next question is recommendations on inexpensive pregnancy testing instruments. <laughs> so I'm sorry to, to laugh about that um, because um, um, my preference is an ultrasound machine. And um, you can find used ultrasound machines for a couple thousand dollars, um, but you want to practice to learn the nuances. For instance, never check sheep or goats where you don't know what the breeding dates were, right? Because if you're checking them and they're less than 35 days, 
and you don't know whether to call those open or are they too early to tell. Um, we like to not have the sheep eat the morning that they're going to get checked, but I never withhold water. Um, so little details like that can make a big difference. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I smile is because it is a growing part um, of our industry that producers are wanting to do more and more. But the um, and it's really a lot of fun. Um, but fetal counting um, and fetal gestational aging does take a lot of practice. So just be um, cognizant to learn on your own um, first. Um, so yeah, uh, the, my second most favorite preg testing method or most reliable other than ultrasound would be the um, a blood test called the Bioprin that it can't be done until about, again, about 35 days. Um, after 28 to 35 days, if you Google that, B I O P R, no, wait a minute, P Y R N, um, B I O P Y R N, I think, um, you'll find it's it's a test, and, and a lot of different places can get certified to run it. So you just need to find a lab online that runs sheep and goats because it's. Uh, also a cattle test, but they have to use some different values when they run sheep and goats. Great. Um, next question is, what is the infectious agent causing joint pain in lambs? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so it might not be the same on all farms. If I tell you what the textbook says, it's lots of times a strep bacteria which means that oftentimes penicillin or ampicillin should work well. I find that nothing works well, and I think it's because lambs kind of hide that that's developing until it's been there two or three days. And so in my own lambs, um, I actually sedate them and I flush the joints with sterile saline and leave a little um, um, antibiotic in the joint when I'm done. But um, I don't know that that's cost effective to people who don't have access to drugs like I do. And I find I'm, I'm very effective if I take that approach. All right, um, next question is a little bit on the long side. So starting off, um, this individual has a polypay flock and she pulled a 19 pound lamb the other day. The you started to develop what she thought was a bruise. Is there anything that she could give to the U to help with this? So um, the drug called flunixin megalamine, which um, when it first came out, it was first labeled as banamine. Now it's also called flunixin. I um, can't think of the other names right now. That's a very good um, drug. For, if it's a small flock, it's hard to justify. And it's something I would give once a day. For some, well, I know the reason. In veterinary schools, they teach students it has to be given IV. Um, and the reason is, is they're thinking about the dairy cow where they want a short withdrawal. In a sheep, most of us aren't going to give IV drugs. And so we can give it under the skin or in the muscle. Um, we're going to have a little longer withdrawal period, but, and then the other thing is sometimes it, and then you, Cindy, you're cutting in and out for me. I'm not sure if that's the case for everyone. Cindy, can you hear me? All right, if there are any other questions, feel free to add them in the chat while Cindy is getting logged back on to the call, um, or Dr. Wolf, pardon me. Um, and if you scroll through those chat uh, functions, you'll see some contact information for uh, that product that Dr. Wolf mentioned. Megan, I lost you guys for a little bit. Are you there? 
we're there. So you cut in and out on your response. Um, I heard when you were talking about the injection and, and what students are taught in vet school, and that's where you kind of dropped off for me. Okay, but you can hear me now? I can hear you now, yep. Okay, so I would give that you flew Nixon for three days, um, just once a day, and I would also, if this had just happened like an hour ago, I would put an ice pack on her for as much patience as she and I both had. All right, great, thank you. A um, Couple more questions here for you and then we can move on to the foot rot side. So on the necropsy picture that you show those two lambs side by side, a um, couple individuals are curious on how that black lamb died. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I'm gonna turn 60 in a couple of weeks and honestly, I took that picture so long ago, I can't remember. <laughs> and I have since had to change their names because it's not politically correct to call them what I used to name them just by their wool color. Um, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah. That's all right. Um, let me scroll down here in the chat. Another question, we'll do this last question before moving on um, to the foot rot question or presentation. Um, Dr. Wolf, you mentioned three diseases that goats and sheep share, Q fever, yonis, and what was the third one? I think it was CL, Cindy, that you mentioned. All right, great. It looks like Cindy, it looks like you're muted on my screen and I can't unmute you. I'm back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you haven't moved. I don't know. This internet here is not the best. That's all right. So should I move on to foot rot? We are good to go into foot rot if that's what you're ready for. Okay. All right. Hopefully this internet will behave. Okay. Um, I'll try to go pretty quickly. Um, first of all, it drives me crazy when I'm at a place and somebody comments, oh, they must have foot rot because they see one lame sheep. Um, for those of us who have raised sheep for a long time, you know that not every lame sheep has foot rot and that really the only way to know is to actually have a look at the foot. Um, <clears throat> there's definitely a been a change of thinking that, um, that when we look at feet, we should do a minimal amount of trimming and never trim um, radically. Try to never cause any bleeding. And lastly, sheep foot rot is not the same as cow foot rot. So if you're getting advice from somebody and they're saying, oh, give it this, that'll take care of it, that's how cows do, then, then that person is not the one who should be giving you your advice. Um, the organism that causes sheep foot rot is carried in in in. Did oh. sheep? It may not be very bacteria, and um, the um, the organism can survive for two weeks outside of the sheep. Okay, um, some pictures. So let's look at this. 
the, um, how much infection has underrun or undermined the sonus foot because there's so much um, dried um, manure and bedding and whatever. So that one we'd have to use our foot trimmer to get that cleaned up to tell how, how much more involved the infection was. But it could be this involved where the whole part of the sole got eaten away from in between the toes headed um, toward the outside this direction and then toward the toe. Okay. Um, let's just not focus on this um, case too much. We'll focus on what we did. Um, so this, this was a flock that had some infection. Um, they um, probably weren't getting the best advice and what they were doing wasn't working very well for them. Um, the soil type was heavy clay. We can't change that. Um, there were ponds that were a watering source. Um, that's been a challenge for me to change too. I'd like to change that, but um, I'm not the sole decision maker. And then there wasn't a really good approach to when they brought in new um, breeding stock as far as isolating and, and making sure their feet stayed healthy before they got introduced. <coughs> In foot rot, there's lots of what we call different serotypes, so think of them as strains, um, and some are very aggressive. In this particular flock, they, um, <clears throat> they had a very aggressive strain. So here's the sheep coming in, um, and what did we do? Um, we started um, doing a couple different things. So one, we um, they became members of the um, California wool growers, and that was a method um, that they could then buy um, footbax vaccine from the California wool growers to vaccinate the ewes with. Um, we also would foot bathe these ewes for about five to 10 minutes in 10% zinc sulfate solution um, in, this, in the late spring, summer, and fall, so when there were active cases going on. And, um, Whenever the ewes went through the foot bath, and also if we treated any um, individual ewes, um, those sheep stayed on dry ground in a building for three days. Um, and then they also kept better records, so if ewes didn't respond to the treatment, they were marked as a cull and then ultimately culled. Um, then I just want to say that when people want to deal with foot rot and want to move um, into control with a goal of eventual eradication, it's um there's a big commitment on the part of the owner and then whoever else is part of the team. So like on this, oh I hope this internet stays working. On this team, um, I'm part of the team as the veterinarian. And um, anytime they say, oh, we've got three lame sheep, and I'm like, oh, text them back. And I say, let me know what you find. And we all like jumping up and down for joy when it's just a needle from a locust tree or it's just some mud that got packed in there um, rather than foot rot. So this is a long, hard disease to get rid of, but it can be gotten rid of. Now, talking about the communication, if you have a team that's helping you deal with foot rot, try to get your control program put into writing because this is a place where we had a breakdown in communication. It turned out better than it would have otherwise. Um, but what happened was, I don't think I told them to put the use inside the barn for three days after we foot bathed, um, but that's what they heard. Um, and so they were doing that and it seemed to be working for them. So we actually um, have adopted that as part of the program. Okay, so here's um, the recommended site for vaccinating is actually like right here, but closer to the ear. This is um, one of the sites that we were using. This is a normal amount of swelling to get with this vaccine because it's in an oil um, based, um, in an oil base. Now they've gone to vaccinating back in the back of the armpit when getting less reaction. Um, so anyway, that's just um, something that a show sheep might not be very popular if it had that. We don't think we caused any abortions vaccinating pregnant ewes. Ideally, if you were lambing once a year, you would um, try to not vaccinate them when they were pregnant. Um, this is just the box the vaccine comes in and this was the um, zinc sulfate solution we were using. 
Okay. Um, I have this and I'll give this to you. We won't spend time on it, but there's a, a group in Ontario that did the math on how to figure out how many gallons of zinc sulfate you needed to mix based on the size um, of, your, of your foot bath. And that was been kind of a helpful tool. Okay, now, um, so here's the foot bath sections that they were using in multiple sections. As I mentioned, we had a minimum of five minute contact time. We, didn't, we don't feel there's any benefit to going to longer. Shorter is um, challenging because you want every foot to be submerged for at least 20 seconds. So we just went with the five minutes because we really want to get rid of this disease. This is a sheep chipper that they have um, on this farm. And um, this is the way that um, is not backbreaking to look at every foot. We look at every foot on this farm, not me, but the people who work there um, at weaning. And, um, and have found a few cases that we didn't know were, um, were there because the sheep weren't visibly lame. So this is kind of a fun little video. You can see it in action. <laughs> So a couple comments um, that are on the side there. Um, this crew of two women, they don't mind looking at feet because this tool is so helpful to them. Um, they're not sore at the end of the day. It seems to be safe for the sheep. It's safe for the people. Um, it problem for um, some flocks is it's just not an inexpensive tool. Okay, so I mentioned that we had our miscommunication. Um, it seemed to work out just fine. Um, when we did treat individual clinical cases, this started in, um, I think toward the middle to end of 2018 and Zactran was off the market um, for a while. So we had to go with a closely related drug, which is Draxin. Um, it worked quite well. Um, we did not use the 200 milligram per mil oxytetracycline because it, when it had been used previously, the results were not as good as we had hoped. So, um, so I was concerned that um, that the team wouldn't think it worked, even if it was working. Kind of like when you go to a good restaurant, you think the food is mostly good. When you go to a restaurant that you think is sketchy, you're pretty sure the the food wasn't good. So. Anyway, that was our approach. Now, when we get cases of just interdigital infection, so just in infection between the toes, nothing on the sole, no bad smell, we just dribble some long-acting tetracycline on those um, and keep them on dry ground. Um, then there's been some pretty interesting work done um, overseas um, that it's very important in foot rot control that when you see a lame sheep, to look at it within two or three days of identifying the lame sheep and not leave it for a week or a month or anything. And by that, that we're stopping some of the um, infection from spreading. Um, on this panel, on, on my side, I think I last presented this at a veterinary um, audience. And um, one of my colleagues let me know that Draxin is labeled for use in sheep in Canada. Um, it, you use the same dose that we would use in this country for cattle or sheep. Um, when I ask our Food and Drug Administration um, team called uh, FARAD what the withdrawal time is, they give me a long withdrawal time, whereas in Canada the, it was labeled with a 16-day withdrawal time. Um, I can't give you a withdrawal time because you're not necessarily my client. Um, when I use Zactran, again, the, the, I've been given a long withdrawal time. Um, it is licensed in the UK for the control of 
these are my go-to drugs. And But if um, the risk is 10% or 20% of your sheep being infected with foot rot, these then become a lot less expensive. Um, okay, so um, it is a welfare thing when we have sheep on their knees, they do lose weight um, and they need to be addressed. Um, were the sheep in lower body condition before we started treating them? Probably. Um, did we think we caused some pregnancy losses with using footbacks? We're still debating that, so the answer is we don't know. And the year before we started trying to really aggressively control foot rot in that flock, there was a higher rate of internal parasites. Um, so that is kind of interesting. Okay. Now when sheep are decided to be culled for foot rot, they get some orange spray paint because I guess the orange lasts longer and they get a, um, a scrapey tag in their ear that is black and it says cull and has all the scrapey information that needs to be there. Okay, so currently um, there are very few cases of foot rot um, in the flock. Um, still vaccinating this flock, still looking at any lame sheep, still looking at all feet at weaning and we're going to have to maybe set this goal a little different but we're getting a lot closer um, to getting foot rot free. Um, this is just a, a real slide. I didn't make this one up. So when rams are purchased now they go into quarantine and their feet are looked at it for a couple times before they get to go out and breed ewes. We don't have a lot of great research on um, resistant genes relative to foot rot. There is a, a test that can be run in New Zealand. Um, I haven't looked at any recent data to see if it's gotten to be a better test. Um, let's see, what else should I share with you? Um, I want to share with you that, um, I want to stress this, that when we have cases of foot rot, we don't radically trim the feet. We barely trim the foot. We treat them with a, a dose of Zactran or Draxin. Um, we could put them in the zinc foot bath. We leave them inside on dry bedding for at least three days and then make a decision. She's getting cured or she needs to be identified as a cull and kept inside away from the population. Okay, so can we eradicate it um, without getting rid of all the sheep? Yes. Um, in this flock, we're on the path that way. We did cull a lot of sheep in that flock though. Um, and why is that? That's because they had um, infection for about three years with very poor control. And so they had some chronically infected sheep. Um, can we go back to um, looking at feet less often? Can we consider not vaccinating? Um, those are all things that we um, are going to be able to move to with time, but I'm going to take it conservative because I saw how devastating their um, strain of foot rot was. And I forgot to mention to you that the owner here really believes that he could be selling about $100,000 worth of ewe lambs a year as breeding stock once he's foot rot free. So that was part of the motivation for becoming, um, to, for controlling foot rot. And um, let's just spend a minute on this slide. So most of the foot rot people see um, in the Midwest anyway are in the spring and also um, in the fall. And part of the reason is because we get more precipitation then. The temperature is approximating 50 degrees. We need that kind of temperature to help the bacteria survive. We maybe have fresh grass growing, so we have some trauma between the toes, or maybe it's muddy enough that we have trauma between the toes. And so this bacterium here is normally in the um, manure of sheep, cattle, what have you. It's nothing, it's not a bad bacteria, it's just normally there. It can cause this infection between the toes, which I call scald. Um, but if we have um, carrier sheep with foot rot, that have the dichylobacter, then we add scald with this bacteria, dichylobacter, and we get that um, really nasty form of foot rot. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now we've all had sheep that have, and often for me, it's like the ram I was hoping to use in a week, all of a sudden gets a swollen claw. And um, 
he actually gets a foot abscess. That's not foot rot. That's actually where some mild foot scald got another bacterial infection on top of it called Arcanobacter pyogenes. Sometimes that's pretty stinky itself and caused an abscess that can actually affect their joints. So that's just kind of a slide worth remembering how all that works. Um, so let's look more at pictures. They're fun. Okay, here's foot scald. Kind of mild looking. It looks a little wet in there. It's not really an abnormal color. Sometimes you get a bit of a gray film. That's foot scald. Sheep can be really, really lame from just that um, little bit of infection right there. A lot of us struggle with this in April and May. This is foot abscess. So you see how this claw is bigger up here? Then this claw, we can see some bloody discharge here. Um, and so I'll trim these feet and make sure I don't have some way, way it wants to drain out this way. And then I'll also um, clean it up and see if there's anything that wants to open and drain here. Um, and then I would put this one on what I call, what we would call in small animal vet medicine cage rest. I'll put it on stall rest and give it um, a long-acting antibiotic once a week um, and hope it cures. Sometimes we'll even wrap it up in a like a poultice. Okay, so that's a, a little fast, but we're getting short on time and I'm sure there's some questions. Yeah, there were. Um, so the first one was, what is the difference between foot rot and foot scald? And this was asked um, right before you started the presentation. So I think you hit a lot on that. Is there anything else you want to touch on that or move on to the next question? Well, the only other thing I'd like to say is I wish the um, British veterinarians were wrong, but they think all foot scald is a milder form of foot rot. And I'd like to think that's not the case. And the reason I present my side of it is because we have that Fusobacterium necrophorum that's a normal part of our in normal sheep and goat and sheep goat cow feces manure so um and i know that if we put those animals on dry ground um they're gonna and and maybe walk them through a zinc sulfate foot bath even without any antibiotics that they're going to straighten out whereas if we do nothing with um foot rot they're not going to get better unless the maggots eat their foot off all right thank you um have you ever heard of pregnancy losses from CDC vaccinations 30 days before lambing due to the vaccination? Or CD, CDT, pardon me. Oh, um, no, so when I, when I see problems with CDT vaccination, I think we have to look at the people um, and the management involved. Like, was it just too stressful to the sheep? because um, CD&T is one of the sort of tamest vaccines we have. So did we bump the sheep too much? Um, did we have a contaminated bottle? Um, did the sheep miss a meal? Um, but just the vaccine itself, especially if you could sneak up and give it to a sleeping sheep, they should do just fine, even though it's 30 days away from lambing. Great, thank you. Um, Two more questions for you. The first one is, um, is topical tea tree effective if used in interdigital irritations? Well, that's a really good question. I'm afraid I don't have experience with that, although I've used some tea tree oil um, on human things. Um, and I think it'd be worth a try. Uh, probably we need to dilute it down and I'm not sure what to say to dilute it down with right at the moment because Think of it as making an astringent rather than oil-based because um, they say it's pretty hard on people when you use it full strength. But I think that'd be worth a try. Let me know how that works out. <laughs> All right. Last question for you is, um, what about some treatment options for heel mites and goats? So we use some of a product called Tactic. Um, it might still be out there. I'd have to look. Um, that we would apply for heel mites in sheep. And I don't know if the um, question asker has tried that. If we still have that, I'd use that. Um, <laughs> other products are gonna be um, like more than 
like too off label for me to say on a public webinar um, that would work. Um, so let me think about something I could say. <laughs> well, yeah, does anybody Google um, to see if tactic is still out there? I'm trying to look quick because it's been a while since I've had to worry about that. Um, they have used uh, oil-based things to suffocate the mites before. That's what they've used in the past. Okay. Yeah, this product is, looks like it's still there. It's spelled T-A-K-T-I-C. Um, the other thing that would probably work too if what you have been doing hasn't been working is um, lime sulfur dip. Um, lime sulfur is something that's made for dogs but is used uh, in other animals um, and that's something that I'd look at as well. All right, great, thank you. Um, those are all the questions that we have for you right now. Okay, well thanks everybody. Thanks for joining on today, Cindy. And thanks for everyone else for joining on. Um, if you were on last time, we wrap up with a poll question. Um, and then if you have any questions, we'll send out Cindy's slides, the recording to this Zoom, and um, contact information. And you guys can feel free to send any of us um, questions that you may have. So I'll start that um, last poll um, that we have for you guys. And this is just really to give us a better idea of how you all would like information and what topics you would like to see in the future. So feel free to drop any topics in that chat function that you also use for questions. Um, and then when you first joined on, you saw some different events that we have coming up in UW Division of Extension on small ruminants. Um, so I'm just going to pull up one of those events here if I can figure out how to share my screen with you all. All right, here we go. So you guys should be seeing a, a uh, Microsoft Word document on your screen about the Arlington Sheep Days that's hosted at the Arlington Egg Research Station. Um, so check that out before you log off. Let us know if we can help you, you know, answer any questions about um, Arlington Sheep Days. We're pretty excited to have that coming up and hosted um, at UW-Madison and by Todd and Bernie, who are on, on this call and this team as well. Don't forget too that uh, <clears throat> next week we'll be hosting our first ever uh, open barn, open lambing, if you want, however you want to call it, uh, next Thursday from three to seven here in Arlington. So those of you that are more local are welcome to come view what's going on. We've got a lot of ewes due to lamb over the next two to three weeks. So hopefully there'll be some good interactive opportunities to do some demonstrations and things like that for you while you're here. Bring your questions for us. Myself and a few of our staff will be around to tell you what's going on here and maybe be able to answer some questions, troubleshoot some of your, your problems that you're having during lambing season, and we'll see where this program goes in the future. Thanks, Todd, and I'll pull up that um, those dates right now for the other events so you guys can jot those down if you like. And here's that slide with all of the dates of events that we have coming up.
once you all have filled out the poll questions um, and entered any of your questions that you have, feel free to jump off the Zoom or you can unmute yourself and ask some more additional questions. Um, if you're looking for contact information to get a hold of any of the four of us that are working together uh, to bring you all the webinar series, here's all of our contact information that should pop up on your screen right now.